talks. And uh, so uh, let me share with you a couple of uh, uh, kickoff remarks for the for the discussion today and to uh, have a brief uh, comparison of what was happening uh, uh, during the financial crisis and what challenges uh, we face today. Uh, you know, being at the university, uh, let me start with some uh, general a bit theoretical consideration regarding how we perceive the world and how we approach the, the risk. So one, um, one, view and, one view and one approach is uh, based on work uh, on the work of Arrow Debru uh, economists. Uh, today's, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, models, uh, general equal models are based on their work. And in fact, it's part of the mainstream. For instance, central banks um, uh, forecasting and uh, models of central banks are based very much on uh, this type of models. In other words, um, it uh, presumes that there's a certain probability distribution of future states and that we can predict the future. Uh, <clears throat> similarly, uh, in um, uh, uh, securities market. It was the work of Markowitz Merton, and also uh, it uh, uh, it is based on the expectation that there's a certain probability distribution, and we can uh, forecast what uh, will be happening. It's also uh, closely related to uh, the concept of rational expectations, and despite all the criticism. Uh, whether we, uh, whether our decision making is uh, rational or not. So personally, I, I believe that there is a certain, let's say, core of our decision making is uh, is rational. On the other hand, <coughs> uh, uh, we uh, certainly uh, know names like Milton Friedman and Fried Friedrich Hayek, and these guys, <coughs> these uh, famous economists, they were very skeptical about the our ability to to forecast the future. Uh, for instance, Milton Friedman, he is uh, fam famous, uh, you know, regarding many aspects of, of, of his work, but uh, one of them is that uh, uh, he proposed some rules for the monetary policy. So on the one hand, he, uh, he was arguing that the role of the central bank is, uh, was to uh, target inflation. Nevertheless, he didn't believe that uh, we can forecast inflation and that uh, we can target inflation directly. And uh, he recommended to have some some rules uh, how to how to behave and how to structure the uh, the monetary <coughs> policy. So this is that uh, you know monetary uh, monetary framework he recommended. Uh, similarly, Friedrich Hayek uh, he uh, he believed that uh, the you know the world is so complex that we can hardly rely on some statistics on uh, some probability distribution. Why I'm mentioning that, um, I believe, and I mentioned already that, uh, for instance, central banks, but policymakers in general, they rely very much on the pre predictability of the future and that uh, uh, the decisions, uh, you know, by policymakers are are based on on this on this belief, especially and obviously it's uh, why I. Uh, emphasizing that um, uh, certainly the monetary policy is exactly that uh, policy making which relies very much on our ability to predict the, uh, the future. And that's why central banks uh, have uh, gradually moved uh, to, to that area of inflation targeting in the last 30 years. On the other hand, uh, despite the fact that uh, I expressed my belief that uh, uh, we can uh, base our policies on, 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 you know, on this assumption. It's clear then uh, that in situations like uh, we had 10 years ago in the financial crisis or today, that there are so huge shocks that uh, uh, we cannot rely on uh, some kind of the probability distribution. And that, uh, that structure of essential complexity in, uh, if I use uh, the word of uh, Friedrich Hayek, so that the uncertainty and the complexity is so huge that uh, we must uh, uh, we must uh, work a bit differently, and that uh, the decision making is much more complex and much more surrounded by a huge uh, uncertainty. So we observed it uh, already in the um, uh, previous crisis. Uh, start started in 2008, the financial crisis, which uh, became global. And on top of uh, of this argument that uh, 
the, uh, the, the uncertainty increased uh, uh, dramatically. We also found that the institution set up, uh, the setup of one institutions was not appropriate to, uh, to those challenges at that time. In other words, uh, it, uh, that uh, our decision making changed completely, but also the institutional setup was necessary to change. So today, because our memory is relatively short, let me let me remind you how substantially uh, the financial world uh, has changed. Uh, you know, even before the financial crisis, central bankers and policymakers were aware of uh, the problem with the financial stability. So central banks focused on uh, consumer price index. But uh, <clears throat> we were aware of the fact that there are some, you know, uh, other other markets um, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, real estate, uh, uh, securities market, and uh, <clears throat> that th this is something which is not captured by uh, by the central bank standard uh, policy making. Uh, so uh, we. Uh, uh, started to analyze the financial stability. Nevertheless, we there was not any specific or legal mandate regarding the financial financial stability, and it changed completely very quickly. Uh, there were uh, new institutions. G20 set up the Financial Stability Board, the global uh, framework for for discussing uh, financial stability challenges. And primarily for us, it's very important how uh, the EU and the Euro the eurozone uh, changed. Uh, at that time, we had, uh, uh, you know, advisory agencies like uh, European uh, uh, Banking uh, Agency, but it became European Banking Authority, which much more power uh, 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 regarding uh, uh, regarding regulatory uh, frameworks. What uh, was was completely new was uh, uh, an is European Systemic Risk Board, and it's exactly the institution or the platform where the financial stability challenges can be discussed. It didn't exist uh, before the financial crisis, and that's completely new institution consisting of central bankers and supervisors across uh, the EU. Uh, also, uh, the European Central Bank uh, and the supervisory uh, framework has uh, changed. Uh, so we know that uh, today there is a so-called single supervisory mechanism at the level of uh, the ECB, at the level of the Eurozone, sometimes called the banking uh, new union. Uh, the, uh, the rationale beh behind that change is quite clear. I am very sorry to interrupt you. May we ask to share your PowerPoint again? Uh, okay. It disappeared. Yes, when you asked uh, at the beginning if we can hear you, it was and all right. But after the introduction, we now, uh, did not. Now yes, okay. now it is working. Thank you okay. very much, and uh, I am sorry for okay, an interruption. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, regarding uh, regarding the single supervisor mechanism, the rationale behind it is, uh, was quite clear. Uh, despite the fact that uh, we had more or less the same uh, regulation uh, regulation for the financial market, uh, that it was quite substantially harmonized, still the enforcement of the implementation at the national level was uh, was different. Uh, and especially for the big institution, international uh, uh, financial uh, financial institutions, it uh, it was perceived that uh, there should be much more uh, that the approach should be much more integrated. So today, as we know, uh, the ECB su supervises directly more than 100 big institutions across the EU and uh, co across the eurozone and cooperates very closely with national regulators regarding other financial institutions. Uh, another important aspect I would like to mention here, and it was also a big change, is uh, the so-called Recovery and Resolution Directive. Very sensitive uh, document, very sensitive direct directive. It was quite difficult to uh, to achieve and to uh, to achieve it and to agree to reach a consensus uh, across the EU on that. We saw in the financial crisis that um, many financial institutions. Uh, 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 were in troubles, and uh, uh, you know, policymakers at the national level 
uh, had different attitudes to uh, to how to resolve the situation. But you know, having uh, the single market uh, and having these into, uh, op uh, and taking into uh, into account the fact that these institutions operate across across borders across the EU, it's uh, it's desirable to have the. Uh, harmonized uh, approach to uh, to that institution when uh, it's in, in it's in trouble. So the, the recovery the resolution directive, which I consider also very important. You know, sometimes uh, some people argue that um, uh, typically we prepare for uh, the past wars, and that uh, that uh, the whole uh, wave of uh, regulation and changes, including these institutional changes, that it would not help us in the in the next crisis. So on the on the <clears throat> on the one hand, it might uh, uh, it might look uh, uh, this skepticism might look uh, uh, you know uh, legitimate uh, when we look at the at this crisis because the nature of this crisis, the COVID crisis, is completely different. Nevertheless, I would dare to argue that uh, those changes uh, made uh, the financial system much more robust and resilient. And if we compare the situation 10 years ago during the financial crisis when we face failing institu financial institutions and the today's situation when the financial sector is one of the pillars of uh, of the stability of resilience. Uh, so I believe that uh, those changes made some some sense. So still, uh, you know, it was a, a new challenge and new mandate for central banks at financial stability, and it's it would be a, a topic for another uh, another conference. Uh, how this uh, mandate is. Uh, 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 is worked out within within the central banks because it's not easy to uh, to say uh, where is uh, frontiers between the price stability, financial stability, and supervisory functions. So it's it's still the open open issue. Nevertheless, the fact that central banks and policy makers uh, focus much more on the financial stability is <coughs> is important. Uh, now let, let me just mention some uh, uh, some uh, some changes and some uh, uh, challenges to the financial sector and policymakers uh, responded relatively quickly. By the way, this is another big difference between the uh, financial crisis and uh, the present crisis. Uh, in my view, the mindset of policymakers have changed and the response was much faster, especially at the level of the EU as compared to the uh, financial crisis. At that time, uh, you may remember uh, huge discussions at the level of the ECB, uh, what policies can be uh, can be adopted and whether the mandate of the ECB enables uh, quantitative easing and so on. Uh, but generally speaking, it seems to me that uh, the uh, response of policymakers was much faster this this time. Uh, there is a number of technical issues regarding the regulation because I mentioned that the wave of regulation in the last ten years and some some of them have not been implemented fully. So, for instance, regulators immediately uh, said that it's not uh, necessary to comply completely with the liquidity, liquidity coverage ratio. Uh, very important. There was a discussion between regulators and uh, and commercial banks how to uh, uh, how to work with uh, uh, with uh, delayed payments by uh, by borrowers. Uh, and we remember from the previous year that uh, many countries, including the Czech Republic, accepted some kind of uh, moratoria on uh, debt uh, debt payments. Yeah, so it, it seems to be a relatively simple decision, nevertheless, from the point of view how the bank operates and how to create um, uh, provisions. It's very important how to deal with uh, this moratoria, whether it means that uh, it must create automatically provisions or not. So that the recommendation and the decision of regulators in, in this aspect was very uh, very important. So many, many technical details and uh, my my perception is that really that communication between the financial sector and regulators uh, was much more flexible as compared to the previous crisis. Now let's uh, let's look at some uh, some some figures. Uh, 
uh, a, a comparison uh, in terms of uh, GDP uh, interest rates. I mean the uh, policymakers' response um, in that area of the monetary policy and also the the public debt. So here it's interesting to to see that the uh, previous uh, crisis, the, the financial crisis, it was, I wouldn't say a standard business cycle, nevertheless, it, it was a certain shock uh, and uh, it, it had um, uh, a relatively long lasting effect. So it's uh, that the recovery was uh, not so not so abrupt, uh, uh, especially in, in case of, uh, of some countries. So uh, it means that the the, the economy, uh, the whole economy, and the structure of the economy was under under pressure. So I'm not sure whether this is you know the precise wording to say that the structure of the economy is much more resilient today, but perhaps we can we can say it in this way. Uh, in other words, uh, the the shock uh, this time uh, and the impact uh, on the uh, GDP performance is uh, much uh, bigger this time. But until now, all institutions predict that uh, when we switch on, that the economy would start uh, working again relatively smoothly. In other words, the the structure of the economy, including the financial sector. Uh, has been quite uh, quite resilient. Obviously, uh, we must take into account the fact that some part of the economy will be uh, will be damaged, and uh, the recovery would uh, last longer. But in general terms, looking at the economy, uh, it can be expected that uh, the recovery would be that uh, uh, V-type recovery and that uh, we uh, should return to uh, uh, to uh, you know standard economic growth another observation uh, i would like to point to is uh, the synchronization of the cycles uh, it reminds me the discussions about uh, the independent monetary policy of uh, countries like the like the Czech Republic and the argument uh, against the common currency is that there can be asymmetric shocks and that uh, that's why it's important to have the imp independent monetary policy. It seems to me that comparing, uh, uh, looking at this uh, charge and comparing the performance of uh, uh, the Czech Republic and, and Euro area, we see uh, that uh, the cycles are quite uh, synchronized. It's due to the fact that our exposure to the EU and to the Eurozone is uh, really substantial and that uh, the room for potential asymmetric cycles are relatively uh, limited. Uh, another interesting aspect is uh, the the response of uh, of central banks. Uh, uh, we can see when we look at the left uh, uh, left side of, of the chart that the response of the uh, US of the US central bank was faster. And I mentioned already the long lasting discussions uh, at the level of the, of the ECB about the mandate of the ECB. And uh, so it's uh, that, that was why the, the ECB responded uh, later than the US, and you may remember those uh, those discussions at that time uh, that the ECB was uh, was too slow and that uh, it damaged the, the the EU economy and the, the, and so on. So this time uh, the uh, response was uh, uh, was very very quick. The difference was that uh, the uh, the uh, eurozone. Uh, uh, interest rates remained at very low level, and in the meantime, the U.S. Uh, economy uh, started to to have uh, higher higher interest rates. Nevertheless, in fact, we more or less remained in, uh, and including the U.S. Uh, uh, central banks remained in uh, the area of quantitative easing, uh, which is uh, more substantial during the crisis now, and obviously it brings a lot of uh, challenges and questions for the future. It means can we return to the normal uh, normal state normal policy making what uh, uh, looking at the balance sheets of uh, central banks what does it mean uh, what's the influence uh, regarding uh, uh, yields uh, in the long term does it mean that central banks would remain uh, players in the money market obviously gradually uh, uh, there should be some kind of um, uh, 
uh, normalization of uh, of how policy making uh, look and uh, the central bank should focus on inflation targeting with standard uh, standard tools but at this moment we are at the level of uh, more or less zero interest rate barrier and that's why central banks use uh, uh, these uh, uh, you know specific policies like quantitative uh, easing but <clears throat> i hope and i believe that uh, it will uh, that we will return to uh, to the normal uh, normal state and norm, normal policy making nevertheless there are some trends behind these uh, levels of interest rates uh, and this is not only about the nominal Yep. So this is uh, this is also about the real interest rate, which has been declining. So there might be some long-term trends. Like uh, so um, uh, it's so there might be some uh, some uh, some trends uh, behind you know these. Uh, uh, this uh, th this response to, uh, to and this can be uh, demographics uh, aging and uh, the necessity to create more more savings. So also these factors can contribute in longer term to um, to uh, uh, to lower interest rates in the in the longer term. Obviously, uh, the issue which is being discussed very often is uh, uh, the the fiscal policy. Uh, and uh, uh, also the question whether we can uh, whether we can expect uh, the uh, the return to uh, lower uh, uh, debt uh, to GDP ratio. Obviously, it was excessive because uh, before the crisis, uh, except some some countries like the Czech Republic, Germany, and some others. But uh, uh, many other countries remained over. Uh, uh, over uh, uh, with, 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 with very high debt uh, in terms of uh, the ratio of uh, debt to GDP. Uh, here I would like to uh, to point to the uh, fact that there is very uh, significant difference between the debt level and dynamics. We hear from politicians sometimes that our level of debt is, uh, is low and that uh, we should invest into the future and that the uh, the uh, that is not a problem, but uh, the dynamics for the financial markets and for investors, the dynamic of the bet, of the debt is very important. Plus, I would like to also remind you that <laughs> there's a big difference between big economies like uh, Germany or the UK and small economies like us. We saw it in the previous financial crisis that, for instance, Latvia, uh, which uh, and Latvia had relatively low debt, but the dynamics was very high, and practically overnight they they were not able to borrow in financial markets. So as I say here, life is perhaps not always fair, but our position in financial markets is certainly different as compared to Germany or the UK or the US. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 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 with some colleagues, we. Uh, wrote a paper for the OC, o, o, OECD and we ran some simulations regarding the uh, stabilization of the debt at certain levels and we uh, reached the conclusion that the stabilization of the check debt is uh, okay until, until you know uh, up to the level of 45 percent of GDP but for Germany it's uh, relatively easy for uh, 80 percent of GDP or even even higher so uh, this uh, we should uh, have uh, have in mind uh, you know for a long time the uh, uh, fin uh, the finance ministry uh, for previous decades was uh, very disciplined and uh, ran uh, and applied quite conservative fiscal policy today hopefully it will remain uh, this uh, what i call the dna of the finance ministry but i'm a bit concerned about uh, uh, about uh, changes about uh, abrupt uh, uh, decreases of uh, of taxes uh, in this situation and so on so so we will see uh, still i uh, i'm optimistic uh, i'm optimist and i hope I, and i hope that after this crisis uh, there will be a, a, a consolidation of the 
uh, of the public uh, finance again, but uh, we will see. So last, my last uh, slide is on uh, how to deal uh, with the crisis and what's important preconditions for handling the crisis. And it's, I think that uh, these principles can be applied at the national, international or the local or the uh, company company level. Always there should be some, some vision uh, and uh, followed by a clear crisis management. Credibility is extremely important. And for instance, I think that today uh, the credibility, the Czech government uh, misses the credibility in eyes of, uh, of uh, taxpayers or of the, of the population. The government seems not to uh, believe uh, and not to have trust uh, into the population and uh, vice versa. Also looking at the communication uh, in the Czech Republic, but also in, the, in other countries, so it uh, lags behind the potential and it's obviously uh, suboptimal. Uh, sub by and large, I think that uh, behind that there should always be uh, the leadership and looking uh, around, uh, you know, looking at the Czech Republic, but some other countries as well. I think that uh, leadership uh, in terms of policy making and policy leaders, uh, this is something we, we have been missing. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, I uh, These are my kickoff remarks and hopefully there's still some a couple of minutes uh, left for uh, your questions and for Q&A discussion. Thank you very much for your speech. And uh, there's a uh, one question in the chat and the rest of the uh, questions will be asked uh, through microphone. So the first question is that is there any regulatory measure to develop in the banking sector that would you stress? Uh, uh, you mean a measure which should be developed or which has been developed? So, uh, well, considering uh, whether there is something uh, I would propose, uh, I don't have any specific in mind. It seems to me that it's 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 really the wave of regulation in the last ten years. So at this moment, we have a problem to implement all of that. Uh, one of the biggest changes, but not the only one, is that uh, and and you know the reason why the uh, banking sector is so resilient that there is much more capital. So banks uh, didn't have enough capital uh, at the, uh, the previous financial crisis, and that's why they, they were failing. So uh, today banks have uh, a lot of capital, and this is uh, one of major reasons why they are much more resilient. Otherwise, thinking of, about what, what we need uh, more, I, I don't have any specific in mind, something, something new. It seems to me that perhaps we have uh, too much regulation <laughs> And certainly, I don't see anything I would propose. Uh, propose uh, something new. Thank you for your reply. Uh, now, uh, let us have uh, some questions uh, through the microphone. So, who uh, wishes to ask a question, please raise a hand in uh, Teams application and unmute your microphone. So. Well, I can see there's uh, one hand uh, risen, so uh, please. It's me. Can I? Yes, please. Yes. Mr. Governor, my question is on public debt. Uh, are there any limits for public debt? Because it's several days ago, there were, there were information on global public debt that is 355 percent of global gdp uh, how this will be uh, solved or is it possible to solve it well i uh, obviously it will be diff uh, more difficult for some countries but uh, my my opinion is that you know uh, 
countries like Germany, uh, the United States, the UK, France uh, and others that uh, they will be able to to resolve that. We saw, for instance, after the previous financial crisis, when the dynamics of the debt was also quite uh, quite uh, quick, uh, looking at Germany, for instance, but the consolidation was uh, also, you know, when the economy recovered, the, the consolidation was also relatively, uh, relatively quick. And uh, it uh, helped also for the Czech Republic, because you may remember that uh, with uh, the decline of GDP, uh, and growing debt, the debt GDP ratio grew up from less than 30% to 45% within two years. But over a couple of years, with recovering the economy, we uh, managed to uh, return to levels around 30% again. So, as I have said, I believe that the economy uh, globally, including the Czech Republic, uh, when we switch on and when this uh, COVID risks uh, uh, will disappear that uh, uh, economies will uh, start uh, uh, you know performing again and this is a basic assumption for any any consolidation obviously i know about the concerns also in the business co business community about inflation that uh, and that uh, it's uh, it's almost impossible to get rid of of uh, these debts without uh, without inflation uh, you know, in this respect, my it's it's true that this is you know pro-inflation factor, but I believe that uh, until central banks uh, remain uh, independent, so that they should be able to to defend inflation. And you know, central banking uh, has changed enormously in the last thirty years uh, <clears throat> when. Uh, uh, monetary policy frameworks uh, left uh, fixed exchange rates and problems uh, we saw in the 80s uh, stagflation. So starting in the 90s, uh, it, it was a really new institution set up for central banking. And uh, so we observe independent central banks and, you know, my, my belief that uh, uh, that uh, we will not see inflation is really the independence of the central bank. And until, until today, uh, you know, I, I regarding uh, especially CPI, consumer price inflation, uh, central banks fight rather with deflation rather than inflationary pressures. Another question is the, the impact on other markets like securities, uh, like uh, like uh, real estate and residential houses, um, that's certainly correct. That's inflation. That's the debate about the financial stability and what <coughs> we can do about it. You know, very interesting discussion is about whether the monetary policy should be used also for, you know, <coughs> capturing that uh, financial stability problems like uh, like housing prices, but <coughs> the. Uh, the experience is not very positive. So uh, in Sweden, they uh, they try to use monetary policy and to tighten the monetary policy because uh, they had also booming uh, prices of housing. But the outcome was that inflation uh, was going down. Uh, I mean, consumer price inflation, but including the perform performance of the economy and the impact on housing prices was very limited. So uh, personally, I'm a believer that these are two disciplines. One is CPI, standard monetary policy, and then other other markets. And regarding uh, housing prices, it's better to apply the rules uh, like LTV, loan to value ratio, <coughs> that service to income ratio, and, and these two. And that's why, for instance, the Czech National Bank also asked for uh, for for this power that, that they uh, that they uh, it can use uh, these uh, these elements. So. I'm optimistic. I believe in independent central banks, and I must say, in this respect, I was uh, I was really concerned about uh, uh, statements by uh, the prime minister and the president that uh, the central bank should send should send money to the to the budget and should uh, not uh, increase interest rates and so on. So, but hopefully, I believe that the central bank would be able to uh, to withstand that uh, that pressure. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much. Uh, there's uh, only a little time left, so, so only short question.
if I may, uh, I will ask for all investors that are present uh, in our conference. Um, aren't you afraid that uh, the amounts of liquidity uh, that is flowing in the economy won't cause securities, won't cause a stock market to inflate and maybe create another crisis, another stock bubble, as we saw in 2000? Well, two, two remarks. Uh, well, uh, f first, we should distinguish uh, the liquidity and the, the, the money supply because uh, a lot of the liquidity uh, ends up in the challenge of the central bank. So when you look at the growth of mon monetary aggregates, it's true that it has been growing, but uh, it's something different than uh, the amounts of liquidity. Secondly, <clears throat> uh, on the, you know, there's another trend which goes against the growth of the monetary aggregates, and this is decreasing the velocity of money. So, you know, that impact doesn't have to be so so significant as, you know, uh, uh, as compared when we look just uh, at um, the production of liquidity by by central banks. One point. Secondly, uh, <clears throat> uh, Yes, that, that question is certainly legitimate. I cannot uh, exclude that uh, there will be some some correction uh, in, uh, in in the stock market. But on the other hand, uh, people also look for uh, for new ways how to save. Uh, uh, you know, we have <coughs> extremely low interest rates, and <coughs> people we have really a lot of new investors <clears throat> into investment funds directly into into the market so I uh, saw you know Patria which is a part of the CSO CSOB group so in the recent two years uh, they uh, have managed to get a lot of new investors because uh, people you know look for new ways how to invest and how to <clears throat> get something for uh, for their savings so yes uh, uh, I agree, this is a legitimate question, uh, but it's always very difficult to, to predict uh, whether there will be correction and how, uh, how, sub, how substantial and so on. But there are also some other trends which are behind that, and this is uh, uh, growing savings. Thank you very much. Thank you, of course, for your presentation as well and for your time that uh, you spent with us. Yeah, thank audience. you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Dear audience, this was Zdeněk Tuma.